You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health Podcast. I have Ted Shorter. He's the CEO of a company called Nabriva, N-A-B-R-I-V-A, Nabriva Therapeutics. Ted, thanks for coming. Hey, Richard. Thanks for inviting me on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, tell me, uh, this is probably a strange question. Where does the word Nabriva come from? <laughs> so it's, it's an acronym, and it actually stands for uh, the, the origins of our company, which was the new... Antibiotic Research Institute of Vienna, Austria. Oh, okay. so originally, originally, the Breva was uh, was a spin out of Sandoz Pharmaceuticals and and founded in uh, Vienna, Austria. Oh, very cool. Okay. Yeah. What um, What's your path been like? Like, why are you uh, the CEO of this company? What What's your interest in this area? Yeah, sure. So I've been uh, in and around uh, antibiotic uh, sales and marketing and development for most of my 30-plus uh, year career in the pharmaceutical industry, um, a lot of commercial experience, and I had founded a company in San Diego in 2015 called uh, Zavante Therapeutics, and that was uh, in Zavante is developing uh, a product called IV Fosfomycin, brand name Contipo, and uh, we were acquired by Nabriva in July of 2018, and I became the CEO of the combined company uh, because what lie before the company at that point would be uh, commercializing the two assets, and so uh, I've been here since uh, July 2018. Okay, and what's the uh, the goal of Nabriva? Like, what are you guys working on specifically? Yeah, specifically we're working on novel a- antibiotics. Uh, our first approved antibiotic this past August is a product called Zenletta. And it's a, the first new class of IV and oral antibiotic for the treatment of community-acquired pneumonia in adults in the United States in almost two decades. Oh. And our second product, which came with the uh, Zavante acquisition, is IV phosphomycin. That's a product that's been around uh, other parts of the world for as long as four decades, but never available in the United States. And that is being developed for complicated urinary tract infections and is particularly effective against uh, many uh, multi-drug resistant strains, which is why there's such renewed interest in the compound. Okay. Any, I mean, you know, I know some things you can say, some things you can't, but um, are these antibiotics novel in their mechanism of action, or is it just that uh, you had to find the right compound to attack the uh, you know the bacteria that are causing these problems. Yeah, so it's it's they're actually uh, novel mechanisms of action. In the case of Zenletta, it targets a unique binding site on the ribosome of the cell, uh, the so-called protein uh, uh, factory of the cell, and so it interferes with protein synthesis. And while other antibiotics interfere with the same pathway, this is at a unique binding site that's not shared by any other classes of antibiotics. So it makes the the product less uh, susceptible to resistance and um, a low potential for cross-resistance to other classes. Uh, IV phosphomycin um, targets a compl- is a completely novel class of uh, antibiotics, and it targets a uh, the earl- an early step in uh, peptidoglycan synthesis, so in developing the cell wall, where it irreversibly binds to an enzyme called MURA, and which leads to uh, cell death, and it only tar- and that MURA enzyme is only uh, exists in bacterial cells. It does not exist in mammalian cells. Will these uh, antibiotics be able to apply 
to other kinds of bacteria, like or a broad spectrum of bacteria, or only very few? Yeah, so can, uh, so with in the case of Zenletta for community acquired pneumonia, the beauty of this product is it's, it was intelligently designed for uh, pneumonia, for upper respiratory tract infections. So it only targets the organisms that are prevalent in those infections, things like staph and strep and, um, and the so-called atypical uh, organisms. And it's highly effective against those, but it doesn't have any off-target activity for other organisms you don't really want to kill at the time, like E. coli and some others that we, uh, that we kind of carry around. So from a antibiotic stewardship perspective, uh, trying to preserve antibiotics and use them in the most appropriate way, uh, having a, a antibiotic that's targeted to the predominant pathogens with a short course of therapy is one of the goals that, um, that uh, clinicians would like to achieve. In the case of phosphomycin, it's a broad spectrum uh, antibiotic has coverage for things like staph and strep, but also more serious multidrug resistant organisms uh, like um, carbapenem resistant enterococcus and, uh, and et cetera. And that's the real interest in the product. It's really for its activity uh, against these very difficult to treat gram negative infections. What, um, <clears throat> what makes a, a gram negative infection more difficult than gram positive? Well, uh, first they have a, a, a double cell wall. They also tend to be more pathogenic, and they tend to uh, they've they've tended to mutate uh, into various forms more rapidly than the gram positives have, and so they're hard to eradicate. And uh, certain species are harder than others. Um, and then they you know sometimes they share genes back and forth, and so having a novel antibiotic that kills in a completely different way than any other known class of antibiotic is a real need in the marketplace. And how is uh, the one for communal pneumonia, is it administered locally, like through an inhaler, or is it swallowed as a pill? And would there be any, you know, better localized effect or other sparing effect if it was administered locally? Yeah, so it's, um, it, it's both an intravenous and a bioequivalent oral. So meaning you could uh, start on the intravenous form in the hospital, and when the physician thinks you're stable enough, you can be sent home on the bioequivalent oral. So the, the benefit would be um, a potential to shorten hospital stays or maybe even avoid the hospital altogether. And so it's a, uh, it, it's a, a narrowly focused uh, drug, but it, antibiotic but it uh, can be given by two different routes of administration, and that, um, that's, that's a real advantage for the product. Okay, gotcha. Um, is it possible to make this act, again, locally and not systemically, even though you may um, administer it intravenously, or is that not really possible? Well, we haven't tested it for inhaled applications, but part of the challenge is, uh, of course, with inhaled applications is that you, you know, sometimes have bacteria that are, lurking in other parts of the body like the bloodstream, et cetera. So it's a, um, it, it, they're, they're certainly for certain conditions like cystic fibrosis, uh, inhaled applications are kind of the, um, the pathway that uh, has shown a lot of promise. Um, but for pneumonia, it seems like the systemic route of administration is, uh, is superior. Plus it would be hard to do it uh, with the amount of drug you have to deliver uh, it would be hard to do it in a convenient way in the outpatient setting. Is this affecting the patient's uh, typical or normal microbiome, or is it sparing of, uh, of their microbiome? Have you guys evaluated that? Yeah, it's, it's sparing of it because it doesn't, um, it doesn't have these off-target activities, and that's really the issue with a more broad-spectrum antibiotic like the, uh, like the, the quinolone class of antibiotics. They're great respiratory drugs, but they also kill everything else in the gut, and that's what leads to uh, leads to resistance, and also the emergence of things like uh, C. difficile, which is uh, a problematic organism that that comes from uh, disruption of GI tract. Really, that's great that it's uh, that it's not broad spectrum. That's excellent, and it's rare. It seems like in the antibiotic. No, world. it is. It is, and it's a. Uh, 
You know, it's a drug that uh, you know took 12 years. We discovered it in the, the Breva labs, and it's been brought all the way from the bench all the way into patients now as a, as a commercial product. But along the way, there are a lot of decisions one has to make in drug development, and I think the decision to focus on the respiratory tract and try to optimize the compound for that was a brilliant decision. And it's really kind of a drug for uh, our times. What, uh, how about the condition itself? I, I haven't really heard of it. Community acquired pneumonia. How does it come about? How do people get it? And what does it do? Yeah, so community acquired pneumonia is pneumonia that you, you know, as it, as it says, you get outside the hospital. And so the, uh, <coughs> it's bacteria. It's often a, a secondary infection to a viral infection. Uh, like the flu. Um, it tends to be more prevalent in older patients. Uh, and so you, um, about 5 million cases a year in the United States of community-acquired bacterial pneumonia. And it has a relatively high rate of mortality and, um, and other uh, adverse consequences associated with it. So it's a serious infection. Uh, and it's particularly serious in older patients and those with uh, uh, compromised immune systems or other compromising conditions like diabetes or heart disease, uh, all that makes the patient more complicated and so uh, enters into the, the decision about whether you treat the patient in the outpatient setting or admit them to the hospital. So are you through the clinical trial process? You know, it's been, like you said, 12 years. Hopefully you're uh, either at the tail end of it or through it. Yeah, we're, uh, so we were approved in, uh, Zenletta was approved in August of this year. So we're uh, out uh, marketing the product, educating physicians and hospitals uh, on its uh, role in therapy and where it, where it fits. And so we're right at the front end of that. Our first uh, sales calls were in the middle of uh, September, so we're only a few weeks into it. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, moving along. So, and then our second product, Contipo, um, we uh, expect to see an approval mid-year next year. Oh, that's great. What, what's the um, the apparent efficacy of it? Like, how much of an improvement is it in reducing mortality? Or, you know, what's what's the benchmarks of success for it? What have you seen? Yeah. So, it, our our pivotal trials for the FDA. There were two trials, Leap One and Leap Two, and they were compared to a potent carbapenem antibiotic called moxifloxacin. And these trials are designed to be non-inferior, so it's very difficult to show superiority. However, in the LEAP2 trial, five days of Zenletta uh, had the same outcomes of seven, as seven days of moxifloxacin. And so it's equipotent to a, um, on an efficacy standpoint, of a, uh, a known antibiotic. Um, it's, but it doesn't carry the same level of warnings that uh, the, the quinolone class of antibiotics cover. Uh, they have um, the most severe warnings that the FDA issues for marketed products called box warnings for several serious conditions. And in fact, in 2018, an additional one was added for the potential for aortic ruptures. Um, while that's a rare side effect, it occurs in about one in 300 patients. But if you're a a busy emergency room uh, in a busy hospital, that could be uh, two or three patients a year that you could see with that, that condition, and that's uh, more than uh, most, uh, most emergency departments would like to see. So it's, a, it's an opportunity to replace the, the quinolones, which have uh, kind of a troubled safety record, with a product that can also be given IV and, uh, and by the oral route. No, oh, that's great. Um, how many cases a year in the U.S., for instance, are uh, this type of pneumonia? It's about five million. Um, so it's it's a lot. <laughs> there are a lot of uh, a lot of uh, pneumonia cases each year, and um, like I like I mentioned previously, that you know those that are older and sicker have compromising conditions are at higher risk for uh, mortality. And, and other complications than kind of the young, healthy patients are. Yeah, that's that's pervasive. Wow, that's a lot of cases every year. Well, this will be a, a home run then if it works. Yeah, it it, it works, and uh, you know we have to get through all the uh, all the hoops for reimbursement and 
how uh, things work in our uh, our healthcare healthcare system. So it takes a while to get through all the uh, you know kind of blocking and tackling that's necessary to get the product in a position where physicians can with confidence prescribe and know that their patient will be able to get their prescription filled. But um, you know we're at the start of that journey, um, but we really do think given the clinical profile that has a real role to play for appropriate patients. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, in the, in the, uh, and I guess in the, uh, in the style of what have you done for me lately? Like what's, what's next in your pipeline? What else are you working on? Or is this plenty? Well, this, <laughs> this occupies most of our times, but the good folks in Vienna are back um, hard at work looking at other, uh, other classes of antibiotics, looking at the, uh, the, Pleuromutilin class, which is what Zenleta comes from, and seeing if there's a a Zenleta two in the in in their work and trying to enhance that uh, profile of the product. So uh, stay tuned, and then we have another program that's looking at a novel compound that I can't say much about, but they're um, they're hard at work at and trying to. Uh, uh, have lightning strike a second time, as they say. So, um, and good, smart people. Okay, and probably most importantly, so anyone listening, um, you know, hopefully they don't have pneumonia, but if it comes up, um, will they be able to ask their doctor or their hospital about Zenleta or, you know, what, what can they use to find out more so that they're prepared if this happens or just find out more general? Where do they go? Yeah, so there, there are lots of resources. Um, to to find out about uh, pneumonia and its consequences, uh, you could you know, there's the CDC website. There's things like WebMD that you can always look at, or you can uh, go to our uh, our Zenleta.com uh, website, and um, there's there's information there for uh, patients and prescribers. So it's a uh, there, there's a lot of resources around this because it is such a, a big problem, and, with, and in the in an era where resistance is growing to older commonly used antibiotics the need for new antibiotics that treat those resistant organisms is really a uh, significant unmet medical need today yeah definitely well ted thanks for coming i appreciate it i know you're right crazy busy getting the word out so i'm glad I, i hope i'm able to help and i'm glad you came hey perfect thank you appreciate the invitation and uh we'll talk soon You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Thank you.